uh, as I understand it, the the thrust of the the lectures are people talking about uh, how they got into science, how their end of science works, and that's what I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, there will be a heavy emphasis on the Hubble Space Telescope because that's probably the most visible thing that I've uh, done in my life. The, that is, this instrument, there is a one-fifth scale model, uh, one of two that were built, you know, hanging in this room, and I uh, invite you to uh, examine it afterwards with perhaps a little more insight than when you came through the, the doors this morning. And if we could uh, lower the uh, room lights in the front end of the, the room. Please, Rick, thanks. The, I will approach the, the subject of my career in science uh, there at the beginning and where I can uh, really uh, <laughs> is, uh, is here. And, you know, everybody in this room uh, remembers my weekly reader. <clears throat> And, of course, this still exists. It's some 80 years old now. And it's had uh, several forms and um, several names. But also, but the message of it is still the same. Providing printed material so much better than television and computers uh, to people from grades one through six. And I was one of those uh, readers of this free uh, newspaper in this period. And this is, I can remember in the sixth grade, uh, at, there at Chartrand School, Miss, uh, Miss Jerome, we all, every, remember teachers were always called Miss, uh, that Mrs. Jerome actually gave us all the assignment of writing a, a one-page article on what we wanted to be doing in 20 years. And I wrote that I wanted to be an astronomer observing with the 200-inch telescope at Palomar. Now, why would a kid from the south edge of East St. Louis, Illinois, one of the poorest places in the United States, uh, in a family that had no uh, books in the house except the good book, uh, why would a, a child uh, like that have such a goal? And that's because in the, my weekly reader, I, would, I had seen from the very, very beginning these pictures of the construction of the 200-inch telescope, this one being a picture of the uh, boxed primary mirror, the 200-inch mirror being hauled up the, uh, the mountain road. And then ju just about the time that essay was, was written, there was the dedication of the uh, telescope on the occasion of the American Astronomical S Society meeting in Pasadena, and they all came up there uh, to the mountain for, for the, uh, the dedication program. And I can remember this picture quite well. And boy, this looked really like fun. Well, it didn't take me 20 years to achieve uh, that goal. The, Of course, what we'll see, and you may have seen this in, in other speakers too, that it's both the individuals, but it's also people. And you're going to see a lot of, of pictures of people in this because it is the connectiveness uh, of society that um, guides people's lives. You don't do it by yourself. 
And of course, I did a, a lot of things uh, right, like I selected my parents very uh, well. Uh, here they are in 1930 with my 10 year uh, older sister. That uh, these were Southern Illinois hardworking people who, like many, lost the farm and sold the mule and went to work in industry when a job became uh, available. My mother has a grade school education. My father left uh, grade school after five years. Uh, and they brought home to Dr. Odell, my brother, uh, that and I, just how important education was in breaking out. I also picked my teachers very well. Uh, these are pictures of my high school uh, math and uh, science teachers. On the occasion of the uh, launch, math and science teachers, on the occasion of the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope some uh, 35 years after I had been their student. I was always a, a curious kid who wondered how things worked. Uh, and soon after I started to, or wrote that one page article on, on the Palomar telescope and my using it, uh, I started building telescopes. So I'm a plumber. I, I like to build <laughs> things. That, that I made my first telescope there, grinding the lenses, using linoleum tube, tubes for uh, the tube of the telescope bigger and bigger telescopes. And these teachers uh, made things like that possible, like silvering the mirror in the physics uh, dark room was made possible, something I couldn't have done at home. And also showing me that there was a bigger world out there. But a bigger world for, for a kid of that environment is actually still very limiting. That I couldn't think of any higher goal than being a uh, classroom teacher of science or math, just like these men. And so like uh, many people in that background, I went to uh, a state teacher's college, then called Illinois State Normal University in central Illinois, now called Illinois State, to train to become a uh, classroom teacher. Uh, but something important happened along the, the way. That is in autumn of uh, 1957, when I was a sophomore in uh, high school, this Vostok uh, rocket took off from the, the steeps of Central Asia, then in the Soviet Union, and carried this satellite into orbit, Sputnik 1. Tremendous success. Scientifically, it had some value. This primary value was for propaganda. And the important thing was this combination of images. We have all lived through that period uh, when, when this happened. We know just what a hysterical response there was in the United States for the appearance that the US had been beaten by a large margin in the space. <coughs> and that, had, that the US had been surprised by this. Neither of those things are true. The spy system is such that we knew the launch was about to happen. We knew what the Soviets were attempting. We didn't know if it would work. And the US had its own program going on at the same time. Except uh, the, the US was not putting an emphasis in rocketry on scientific rocketry, but rather on uh, developing intercontinental ballistic missiles. So there was the appearance that uh, 
this bunch of potato farmers out in uh, Central Asia had s suddenly passed up the United States technologically. This, for me, produced a very favorable response because it meant that lots of money and emphasis was suddenly placed on the study of the physical sciences. So that w at, by the time I finished college, which would have been January three and a half year of uh, 59, three and a half years after I finished uh, high school, that there were great opportunities. At that time, there were 14 PhD granting astronomy departments in the United States. Now they're over 100. That it's that kind of growth. But I was very lucky again in terms of people uh, that, and my timing, I guess it was my parents' timing, that, uh, that when I finished college, Arthur Code, then a pro tenured professor at Caltech, was relocating from Caltech to the University of Wisconsin, and uh, where he would form a new, basically a new department out of an old one, one that would be part of the space age in the modern era, rather than old-fashioned kinds of astronomy. Now, you mostly see pictures of my mentors as older people, because I don't have in my own collection people pictures taken at the time. So here, here's our code uh, picture about five years ago. He just died uh, at his 60th uh, wedding anniversary. And I think he was uh, 26 when he, when he married. So Art Code came to Wisconsin and created a new the Department of Astronomy there. The final product <coughs> of that was the first observatory to go into space, the Orbiting Astronomical Observatory. One cannot underemphasize how important it was. The step in building the, the, this observatory was uh, almost as great as the step in technology in building the Hubble. And the price of it was about the same. But in those days, the money was there because we were perceived as a nation to be behind. This was an observatory that would fit into the stage area quite well. It was really uh, very rudimentary, but it was an enormous step at the time. And this gave, gave me an exposure to space science, the potential of it. Now, all this was a new, a new department in a very old observatory, but at a beautiful location over Lake Mendota uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. And I worked for Art Code, and I had an office in the circular room underneath the dome that was very much like the entranceway here. And in that room, on the wall, was a, a picture, a drawing that had been made, a historical drawing, actually, that had been made at the Harvard Observatory of something called the Orion Nebula. Now, I bet a lot of people in this room are familiar with the constellation Orion. We see it in the winter sky. You can see it in early morning once it starts clearing up again here. And if you look at the constellation and look down in this part of the so-called sword of the Orion figure, you see something called the Orion Nebula. And here's that drawing that hung on the wall in uh, the, the student office I enjoyed. So you see, see this grouping of stars with four in the middle that are uh, 
rather obscured in, in this drawing because, of course, it didn't have a very large dynamic range. This slide, this reproduction, doesn't really capture the beauty of that drawing, which represented many decades of efforts of people <coughs> by eye making drawings of the, the nebula. And I thought, that, boy, that's for me. I want to figure out what things like that are and what makes them work. I was lucky in that the world specialists in atomic processes that are operating in nebulae, like the Orion Nebula, had come from Caltech with Art Cold in Donald E. Osterbrock, again pictured here in, uh, I guess he was about 80 when this picture was taken. So he became my mentor, my master, in the uh, Buddhist type sense that uh, he was a taskmaster and expected obedience and expected performance and all of us uh, tried to do our best to perform. I must have because he supported me uh, in an application uh, for a postdoctoral fellowship uh, out at Caltech. And at that time, Caltech was in a joint uh, operating arrangement with the Carnegie Institute, operating both the 200-inch telescope and the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson overlooking uh, Los Angeles. By then, this was a fairly old telescope, but it was the third largest telescope uh, in the world and you could put very modern equipment on the, at where the focal image was, was formed. And so the, that's one of the nice things about a telescope, that you can change the instrumentation on it to bring it up to date. And as long as the telescope is still steady and able to point through the sky, it'll live for, forever. So it was a great bit of fun to be able to use this telescope um, and uh, later uh, after I'd actually relocated I came back and used the 200 inch telescope. But then again I got lucky because the person who had been the director at the, uh, the uh, Wisconsin Observatory had gone out to become the director of the Lick Observatory near San Jose, California, where they were proprietors of the second largest telescope uh, in the world, the 120-inch telescope at Lick Observatory. Uh, I was on the faculty at uh, Berkeley, and great experience now of using the best ground-based telescopes. This is a fairly new telescope and had better, e even better instrumentation than they had at the Caltech telescopes at uh, Palomar. But after a uh, brief period there, that is a year and a half, I was made an uh, offer I couldn't refuse uh, to come to the University of Chicago. And by that I mean this was the one big telescope for all of the astronomers within the University of California system. So we couldn't get, any one of us couldn't get a whole lot of observing time. But Chicago had an arrangement where, uh, with the University of Texas because it had built, the, it, Chicago, had built the observatory out in West Texas. And the Chicago share was very large and I essentially could have as much observing time on the large telescopes there as much as I could uh, actually use, that is get a way to use. What we'd do is go down uh, and observe to, for two weeks at a time, several times a year. The observatory of the University of Chicago is the Yerkes Observatory, which is located 
uh, about 80 miles northwest of Chicago in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. When it was built in the early 1890s, it housed the world's largest telescope in the 40-inch refractor that is still operating in that dome there. Again, a classic building, but doing modern uh, astronomy uh, inside of it. Where I personally observed most was down at the McDonald Observatory in the Davis Mountains of uh, West Texas. And about midway between El Paso and uh, Big Bend, if that, that helps. Beautiful country, a lot clearer in spite of the photogenic picture. Pe photographers like clouds in the, uh, their images. Uh, astronomers don't. Uh, <laughs> But what I would do, and the other uh, staff members there would do, would be develop our equipment, new equipment, new observing techniques, test them out on the Yerkes smaller telescope, then take them down to the uh, this lo better weather, bigger telescope location in West Texas to do the serious science. So while I was there, I was coming up through the ranks and getting more visibility uh, within my trade. And what happens too much is drawing, uh, serving on committees and advisory groups. These advisory groups, <coughs> most interesting ones, were those for NASA. Remember that NASA had been surveyed created in 1958 as a civilian space agency. And by the time I was a full professor at Chicago in 68, and starting to be on uh, advisory committees, that NASA was no longer just a manned space flight program or just the OAOs, but looking for bigger astronomy programs uh, for the future. Now, along the way, I was doing other things besides science, uh, which included uh, some uh, mountain climbing expeditions. Uh, <coughs> this one I pick out because uh, after we'd run out of places to climb, that has got on the top and named, we, could, we had the rights in Canada to name the peak, and we named it after the, uh, an observatory director of the main deceased of the main Canadian observatory. But <clears throat> on this trip, I met and liked, as most people did immediately, this chap, Lyman Spitzer, who this is actually a picture I took on the summit ridge uh, about 30 minutes before uh, the previous one. Lyman at this point was about 55 years old, 1967. But in 1946, he participated in a think tank activity which was charged with defining what the U.S. should be doing with rockets. This was all precipitated by the fact that the Army surplus V-2 rockets that had come from Europe were brought to the U uh, U.S. and people started to do science and military things, U.S. military things with them. So he was part of a vast study of what you could do in the future with even better rockets. And he identified building an observatory in space and elicited all the advantages of that. In particular, you could see all colors of light rather than just those that uh, reach through the Earth's atmosphere. And you could get a much better quality image because the atmosphere, even on a clear night, 
blurs out the appearance of stars. Now this had actually been written in 1923 in a, a German book by the certain man by the name of Hermann Oberth, but Spitzer didn't know about this uh, at the time. But it was, was a natural goal. And it's something that NASA identified very early, but of course, NASA was walking before it could run, so you don't build something like this, what Lyman had, uh, was talking about in 1946, right away. So these connections with him, largely made through uh, mountaineering, all, uh, really got me interested again in space astronomy, going back right to that first influence of art code at the University of Wisconsin. And I started serving on groups with, that were identifying the so-called Astronomy Missions Board, identifying the few, the, what should be the next decade's goals within NASA in the area of astronomy. And at one of our astronomy meetings, this chap showed up, the very photogenic Werner von Braun, who uh, I met him in 68, and he was then the, the uh, leader of the Marshall Space Flight Center. He was famous for developing, in particular, two rockets. One was, uh, in while he was in Germany, the V-2 rocket, which was highly successful, that, uh, and also the Saturn V rocket, which never had a failure that compromised the mission. This particular picture is the launch of, uh, of Apollo 11. That, that was in 69. But in 68, Von Braun knew that this was a dead-end product line. That is, their NASA was not going to be able to use these Saturn V rockets for things in the, uh, the future because the payloads weren't being developed. So he wanted to, in the business world, you would say, diversify the product line there at the Marshall Space Flight Center and get into building payloads and not simply rockets. So <clears throat> he had his chief scientist, Ernst Stuhlinger, convene a group of three of us that had, had served on the this Astronomy Missions Board, to come down periodically to Huntsville and give them advice, give him advice about what new products they should be trying to produce. That is, what science proje projects they should try to grab off for the Marshall Center. Is an interesting group of three. One was Herb Friedman who is a scientist at the Naval Research Lab, who as a young man was given use of several of those Army surplus V-2 rockets in New Mexico, and he made the first observations of the sun and x-rays from above the Earth's atmosphere with the V-2, and had stayed in space astronomy. An another person was, uh, uh, Peter Meyer from the University of Chicago, a cosmic ray physicist, famous in, within physics for discovering and developing the properties of high energy electrons uh, in space. Uh, he was uh, the second member of the Council of Three. And I was kind of the, the boy of, of the group. Uh, I was 31 by, by then, uh, advised them in other programs, and it turned out to be uh, good advice because uh, all of them became major programs uh, for Marshall and for, for NASA. Uh, 
Peter Meyer couldn't say no to being on the advisory group because von Braun's chief scientist, still again this connection of people, uh, had been Ernst Stuhlinger, pictured here when he was only 91, that this man had been Peter Meyer's thesis advisor for his docent or master's degree in Berlin in 1942, just before Ernst was drafted. More significant for our story, it was just, just before he, Peter Meyer, a Jew who had been protected by Stuhlinger, went underground and spent the rest of the war in hiding. So uh, how could he say no? So we gave advice. And we thought it was good at the time, and indeed most of it has worked out. One of the main things that NASA was discussing at that time was something called the Large Space Telescope. Large, three meters aperture mirror. And it was this basically the derivative of the idea posited by Hermann Oberth in 1923 and by Lyman Spitzer in 1946. It looked like this. It was a three-meter telescope seen in cross-section. Uh, the light came in from this end, bounced off the light-gathering big mirror, bounced again off the magnifying secondary mirror, formed an image down here. We knew we wanted, uh, or NASA knew that it wanted, needed to be a long-lived and serviceable observatory, and this was the design at the time. And a, a group of some 10 astronomers were put together in NASA headquarters under the uh, leadership of Nancy Roman to define the scientific mission of such an observatory. Uh, another view of it being shown here. So in this period, 1971-72, NASA was defining in the most elementary way what the Large Space Telescope, now Hubble, uh, would look like. But the assignment to build the observatory was given to the Marshall Space Flight Center. Remember I said that Marshall in Huntsville was pushing to get into the payloads business. But there were no astronomers at Marshall, and I was easily convinced to leave my position at the University of Chicago uh, and come down to be the chief scientist on this program. My goodness, we were all young people then, and the, uh, the only senior person was Jim McCulloch here, the uh, deputy uh, project uh, manager. That Gene Oliver, the chief engineer, stayed with the program throughout. Everyone else uh, left the program except me. And then became the chief scientist on the Chandra Observatory, the great X-ray observatory. And he's helping to uh, engineer the James Webb Space Telescope right now. Uh, here's a more up-to-date picture taken of Gene a year ago from this very location from a course that uh, we gave last year. So he's still very active and in the business. It's hard to believe today that in 1972, when I joined the, the Hubble program, the Hubble was not, in general, supported by the astronomy community. And the argument basically ran, give, if there's $300 million available in those year dollars, it would be better to build 
20 duplicates of the 200 inch telescope and allow so much more observations, many more observations to be made than we're doing now with just this one unique instrument. That was the argument. What that argument ignored is the 200 inch, 16 200 inch telescope would simply be doing 16 times as much of the same kind of science. It would not produce new kinds of science. So others of us believe it was work better to spend the money uh, on building a much more powerful single observatory in space, now called the Hubble. And a pivotal time in, in this process of selling the idea of the Hubble to the astronomy community was a meeting held up in Washington where we were able to get Spitzer, of course, the project manager, the NASA manager, Jesse Greenstein, from Cal, head of the Caltech program, who had always been, again, space astronomy ever since the time that he was given a V-2 rocket that he put an instrument on in 1947, and the thing blew up. And he just washed his hands of space astronomy uh, at that point. But finally he came around and he was willing to come out in public and speak in support. Alan Sandage, who was essentially the anointed heir of Ed, Edwin Hubble, the, the person who discovered the expanding universe and after whom the Hubble is uh, named. Ivan King, Margaret Burbage, Larry Frederick, Gary Neugebauer, George Herbert, John Bacall, Har Harlan Smith were all major figures in American astronomy. And so a lot of this early activity was not only engineering, but organizing scientific support for the, the program. Here are the speakers at, at that meeting. And here is a, a part of the senior group of astronomers that were put together for the uh, actual construction phase. And this is, they're standing around uh, at the operations center for the science around the twin of the uh, model that uh, we have of the Hubble. Okay, a lot of the time over the next 10 years was spent in, in engineering of how the Hubble should, should be built. And eventually we ended up with something that was really quite different from the earlier design. Lower cost, which was still horribly expensive. And the largest possible telescope of a reasonable cost that could be packaged into the space shuttle. And this meant reducing its aperture from the original goal of three meters the 2.4 meters. Now, one of the things that was unusual about the, the Hubble was the fact that it would be serviceable. So a lot of testing was done in the neutral buoyancy simulator uh, down, zero G simulator down at the Marshall Space Flight Center, where astronauts, in this case, Bruce McCandless and uh, Kathy Sullivan, could test out the engineering concepts for how you build something that could be visited about every three years in order to repair and to upgrade the uh, performance of the observatory. Now, the Hubble program dragged out as most large space programs do. Only the Apollo program met its original goal. Now, 
I just read a, a biography of uh, James Webb, the leader of NASA at that time. When he went to Congress to uh, sell the Apollo program, which would have been in 1962, he had been told it was going it would cost $20 billion. He didn't believe it. He had formerly been the head of the office, uh, the, uh, office of Budget for the government. So he went to Congress and said it'll cost $30 billion. Factor of six inflation. So it, it was a $180 billion program. In those days, you could do it. They stuck to their schedule because money helps in engineering. <laughs> now, in this case, this rather complex looking chart shows the amount of time and months until the launch as a function of year. So when we started the hardware phase of Hubble, it was expected that the launch would be in uh, late 1983. There were problems adhering to the schedule and budget, which produced at this point a new <coughs> negotiated budget, launch time, and a new project manager. Troubles then built up again at which time a new budget and schedule launch in late 1986 was planned and another head rolls and another new project manager. We were ready to go in the autumn of 1986 when the uh, Challenger uh, accident occurred in January of that year and from then on there were multiple new schedules as determined by uh, the availability of, of the shuttle. But the Hubble, beautiful, beautiful instrument, was finally completed. Here it's being rolled out of the assembly room into the uh, acoustic vibration chamber for final testing of uh, an entire observatory, and launch occurred in April of 1990. At that point, I had been working on the project for 19 years, and this was, what, 67 years out of, after Hom Herman Ober's book about, you ought to do this. And in terms of my own science, one of the first things I looked at was the Orion Nebula. Remember the object shown in this drawing from Harvard back in the, the 19th century? Now, like many fickle lovers, I had you know, dallied with other astronomical subjects along the way, but always came home to, to uh, the Orion Nebula. And one of the first things I did was to image that the inner region of the object in this you know, exquisite detail that uh, was possible with the Hubble Space Telescope, this glowing gas that's left over from the formation of a cluster of stars uh, about 500,000 years ago. An idea of the resolution of the Hubble. There's a picture of these four stars here, the four bright stars, called the trapezium. And you compare that with that drawing that they are that little dot down in the middle. But the most interesting discovery were things uh, like this. That is, cl the closest thing I have had to a eureka moment uh, as a scientist where you see something entirely unexpected and new and you know what it is. And these are disk 
of material around stars still in the process of formation. And these disks of material composed of gas and dust. And the dust blocks out the background light from the, the nebula and we see them in the disk in silhouette. If the object, the newly formed star, is close to a hot star, outside hot star, then the gas part of it is heated up and makes it bright. So the basic model for a young star derived in large part from this Orion observation is here you have the young star surrounded by a disk of material with jets of bipolar flow of gas coming out of it. And how, what objects like these young stars look like depends on how close they are to a hot star. And if they're distant, we just see these disk of material in silhouette. But how they look depends on the orientation of the disk. This one is an angle about like this. This one is an angle like this. We see the disk almost edge on. Here's another one where the disk is almost edge on, but the whole system there is close to a hot star, rendering the gaseous component glowing on the outside. And here's one much more irregular in form. So the, the Hubble images, together with some ground-based data largely from, from uh, radio telescope has allowed us to actually build a three-dimensional model, a three-dimensional map, if you will. This is not a cartoon, but an actual rendering of what it would look like if we visited the Orion Nebula and flew around on the inside of it. That is, we can determine what's in the foreground, what's in the background, the only real liberty being taken here is that we're, the cameraman is flying at several times the uh, speed of, of uh, light, which of course cannot be done. And you see these fuzzy objects, the so-called proplids, which, and here's one of my favorite go, going past, that these are objects that just were not anticipated. And by making the big leap of performance of the Hubble, you make discoveries. Never could have been done with 15 more 200-inch telescopes. So this is a brief summary of what we've learned. This is the closest region thought to be like the nursery in which our sun was formed. Stars there are only about half a million years old. We see the protoplanetary disks, which are a natural part of the formation of stars. And if there's a hot star nearby, it can affect how it looks. Now we know in the case of the sun that it must, these stars must look like our solar system did at only one half million years old rather than 4.3 billion years old because you look out in the night sky and you see the planets along a line across the sky, the so-called zodiac. They, those planets formed in this disk that we're seeing in Orion. Now, the Hubble has done what we wanted it to do, and this has largely been made possible because the fact that we'd always planned about every three years to visit it in order to repair it, restore parts, and to put in higher quality instruments that actually used the image and turned it into scientific data. By now we've had five servicing missions, and on each one, there were a variety of tasks. 
And let me just cut to the bottom line. The last of the servicing missions uh, occurred in May of this year. The, uh, on that servicing mission, two new scientific instruments, a new camera, a new spectrograph were installed. Two of the instruments were repaired. Repairs were made on the, that exceeded even what we, uh, what we anticipated. And these were possible because the system design was very robust. So that in the case of this spectrograph, the, and this camera, the astronauts actually opened up the outside of the, the box contain, containing the instrument and replaced electronic uh, circuit boards. And at the beginning, I didn't think it could be done, but it was. And those instruments were brought back online. They had essentially been dead because of these electronic uh, uh, failures. New batteries were installed. The batteries in the Hubble had uh, been operating for 19 years. They had been built some five years before that. Were our only, don't we wish our cars uh, batteries would last uh, so long? But of course, they cost more. New gyroscopes, which are used for orienting and pointing the telescope, were installed. New data controllers, uh, a thing that takes the uh, a necessary component that takes the information from scientific instruments and sends it down to packages and sends it down to the ground. Earlier flights, new solar arrays, those things out on those paddles uh, out on the side that convert sunlight into electrical uh, energy. Uh, new computers. You can imagine the improvement in the quality of computers since the HST was uh, built. And remember, we were ready to launch in 86, and some changes were, were made, but basically it was hardware from before that time that was, uh, that was flown. Here's a picture of a servicing mission and you see how very, very similar it is to that picture I showed of Kathy and Bruce uh, training and help us, helping us in the engineering down, designs down at Marshall. Just a handful of results that have come out since this uh, uh, last servicing mission. They demonstrate that the Hubble now is vastly more powerful than it's ever been before because they're able to improve the gyros each time they go in. The scientific instruments are better and better each time there have been a servicing mission. The only reason why the HST will not be able to continue, quote, forever like that 100-inch telescope is that we're losing the transportation system, the shuttle. The shuttle will only make a few more flights and then the fleet will be retired. All of that's being re-examined at this point and for good reason. So, but even if the shuttle continues to operate, it is essentially uh, very unlikely there'll be another servicing mission because most of the flights will still go to the International Space Station. Not long after the servicing mission, once again, a, a cometary body ran into Jupiter. And it was discovered actually by an amateur astronomer down in Australia, but the HST obtained the best follow-up images. These are valuable because they're, they're probes of the upper atmosphere of a planet, this planet. The new Wide Field Camera 3 has capabilities that uh, the, its predecessor did not have. 
They can still take beautiful pictures like this, but they extend into the image, the abilities extend into the infrared. So here's an infrared image of the very same field, and you can see how very different the fields are. And look at these jets here. Remember in that drawing I gave of a young star, how you get these bipolar flows of material out. Those, that's where those are coming from. So this camera has an infrared capability uh, that the other optical cameras uh, lacked. Here's a picture of a planetary nebula, NGC 6603, well, 03 is its telephone number. But an example of a star about twice as massive our, as our sun that's burned out of uh, up all its nuclear fuel and is collapsing down to being something called a white dwarf, which is about the size of uh, the Earth. And as that collapses, it throws out the outer layers of the star, which become uh, a spectacular gaseous nebula. Here, here is a spectrum where the light is broken up into its component colors. Here in the ultraviolet light that the human eye cannot see and indeed does not come through the, make it through the Earth's atmosphere of a particular supernova remnant. Uh, an ultraviolet capability that we did not have before. Another camera, that the repaired camera making beautiful photographs here of, uh, or images of a nearby spark uh, galaxy. Now here is the new spectrograph that was installed looking at the same object, Martarian 817, as had been examined in 1997 with its predecessor spectrograph. And there's, it looks like more signal here, and there's not only more signal, but this uh, image, spectrogram, was made in 1 30th the amount of time. So for purposes of spectroscopy, the telescope is 30 times bigger than it used to be. Another example of this ultraviolet ability to look at highly redshifted objects distant from, from us, in this case, uh, a quasar that in this case would be about a redshift of uh, one half. That is the, uh, the lights moving almost half the velocity, of, or the object moving about half the velocity of light away from us. Here's a picture of something called Stefan's Quintet, uh, a group of interacting galaxies. One thing that we're learning from the Hubble, or have learned from it, that is that the interaction of galaxies one with the other determine the structure of galaxies. And as you look back early in the universe, which you can do with the Hubble because the distant objects were seeing light that was emitted billions of years ago, we see that galaxies form interactively with one another. So one of these galaxies, this one, is actually about one-sixth the distance of these four that are interacting with one another. And so by studying these, you can see how a galaxy, how galax multiple galaxies turn into to one. Our galaxy is a single galaxy until you start looking around the local neighborhood and you see that we actually have satellite galaxies just like these galaxies do. And 
here's the deepest space picture uh, that's been released thus far. It's looking out at a cluster of galaxies, a rich cluster of galaxies, which has a dominant galaxy here in the middle that is grown by coagulation from other galaxies. But you see out on the edge these streaks of light all have in a certain symmetry around the middle here. These are actually galaxies at about a distance of 10 billion light years that are exactly lined up behind, almost exactly lined up behind this massive galaxy. And the gravitational field of that galaxy warps their light, basically magnifies the more distant object and makes it brighter. And we were able to observe it uh, easily in this case with a distorted image. And so basically, this is how I would score uh, this last servicing mission, clearly a 10. <laughs> now, if you want more reading material about the Hubble Space Telescope, I list these, uh, object, uh, these uh, books here. Uh, a rather scholarly book by uh, Robert Smith, a book projecting its science. It was published before the launch. And then I wrote a book on the Orion Nebula, in which I gave one uh, chapter over to my version of the history of the Hubble. Uh, makes a swell Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Hubble's been, been the most rewarding, in the end, the most rewarding part of my career as a uh, scientist. And I show pictures of people in here because it's not just science, but people watching out for one another, working with one another. Uh, a project like the Hubble is led by individuals but still, it's thousands of people working on it, almost all of whom started out with as kids wondering how things worked. Thank you. <laughs> now, I've used up some of your, your question time, but we do have time for a few if, if there are any. The, it was in re, NASA. The question was, how did uh, NASA come into NASA come into being? At the t time, at, that is after Sputnik, there was a desire to catch up with the Soviets, and there had been science programs being supported by different other federal agencies, some of which were oriented towards space. So it was decided to draw all those together under the science part into NASA. Also, there had been rocket developments for military purposes. And so, for example, the Von Braun team then was drawn into the civilian agency. So this gave the structure after its creation in in uh, 58 to carry out a civilian space program. Uh, another space program of which we cannot speak, but we pay for, was also created at that, that time, whose budget is larger than NASA's. That is, there's a military pro space program. Bob. Uh, good, good question. They, they were over. Uh, how, how were the scientific instruments uh, protected against the vibration environment uh, during launch? Good question because the shuttle is a very hostile launch environment because of vibration, not the g forces, but the vibration. So basically, things were overbuilt. <laughs> 
they engineering wise in terms of structural strength they were built to satisfy the G loading induced by shaking during launch. If it had not been for that, they could have been built much more cheaply. So it was a, just a question of designing for that worst case and then testing it on the ground to simulate that environment that it does work. Yes? How do I define science? Uh, it's just the quest for information about the physical world. I, I consider myself a scholar, primarily. My specialty is the physical world. And within that, my subspecialty is astronomy and astrophysics. So that's the way I, I structure it. Uh, have the uh, Russians made any um, comparable progress since, uh, since the competition started? Oh, the, first, the Soviets had tremendous uh, success in, in their manned programs. They had a, uh, the first uh, space station they have had landers on multiple uh, planets. But uh, when the Soviet Union self-destroyed, the Russian space program has not been well supported. But it is still vigorous in terms of launches and indeed, it's very likely if the shuttle uh, system is retired, the shuttle fleet is retired, it is the Russians that we will be buying transportation to our International Space Station is from the Russians. So they, they still have a very reliable uh, transportation system. They occasionally do uh, science payloads. One more back here. Uh, early on after the Hubble launch, we heard that there was something that had been misunderstood or not done right in terms of the ground shaking that led to the launch. So let me just ask you that. Can you explain that? Can you explain the okay, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the question was, what went wrong that the images initially were fuzzy? And what happened was that the mirror, the primary mirror which forms the, the image, had been made with great precision to a slightly wrong shape. And that mistake was made because the test device that was used to uh, measure the shape of the mirror was assembled incorrectly, something that was not reported, that is, the, that there were no questions raised about its alignment. It was not reported to the uh, people who were monitoring the program. The information stopped at a very low level that there might be something wrong with that test device. And as a result, the mirror was manufactured with great precision, but the wrong shape. But fortunately, that this meant that you could calculate exactly what the shape of the mirror turned out to be. So that during the first servicing mission, something called CoStar, a corrective optics device, was put up which corrected the image, essentially putting spectacles right in front of the scientific instruments that corrected the, the image to be as good as we ever expected. So that in each new uh, instrument that's put on the Hubble, 
that correction is put into the, the scientific instrument. And, but it's important to understand that we were doing science even at the beginning. The core of the image was as sharp as we ever expected it to be. But it had this very undesirable flare on the outside of it. So like the propylids, these protoplanetary disk objects, were discovered in the original configuration of the, the telescope because we had learned how to mathematically correct the images so they were almost as good as what was intended. But it's much better not having to do that mathematical massaging of the images. I'm about out of voice, and you folks are all about out of time. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>